ready to go. I'm always motivated when I'm with Dr. Sarin and uh, he and I have traveled the world together reading his articles, your articles constantly to get this fantastic team of people who are publishing, I think, at the highest quality globally leading people to have a change in thought and a change in how they manage liver disease, cirrhosis, acute on chronic liver failure, all these other great areas, and cephalopathy. So I'm very uh, proud to be here. So my second visit to your institute. And uh, my name is Robert Gish. I'm based in San Diego, although I spend about half of each month now in different parts of the world. I'm lucky to be here in India this week. I return home for a few days, and then I come back uh, to Tbilisi, Georgia for a Central Asia meeting on viral hepatitis. It's a teaching workshop, but there'll be people from all over Asia, US, and Europe that are involved with that meeting. And then just following that will be a meeting on hepatitis B in Melbourne. It's called the Molecular Hepatitis B Meeting. But now it's a five-day meeting that has to do with clinical, policy, advocacy, and molecular. So this is really uh, broadened out. Of course, just a bunch of uh, bunch a virologist sitting over and talking to each other about the, the virus, the virology of B and C. And it's really changed now into the best global hepatitis B meeting, although there's a few that are obviously competing with that. I'm talking about that because IHEP is a collaborative of hepatitis B researchers, so I piggyback these slides, updated these slides, but I want to give credit to those. Um, Peter Ravel is one of the key people, Stephen Lombardini, uh, Fabian Zubin, a number of other people, because we are searching for a hepatitis B cure. Uh, we'll dig into that in uh, just a, a moment. A little bit more in the uh, United States, um, where I work, is a number of the uh, pharmaceutical companies, some of our US based, some of our European US based, that are involved with hepatitis B drug development. And I've been working with drug development as far back as the Mividine standard interferon, pegylated interferon, the Broche Global Study, uh, other areas. So I've been interested in hepatitis B. In fact, I was involved briefly with the FIAU, if everybody remembers that hepatitis B drug, which I call the Fiasco drug um, because of the number of uh, deaths that took place um, because of the inhibition of specific mitochondrial processes that led to lactic acidosis, pancreatitis, and liver failure. That's a real hot topic because uh, last week the US FDA issued an alert that the hepatitis C DAA drug combinations that contain protease inhibitors resulted in uh, 73 cases of liver failure, a number of deaths due to liver failure with those hepatitis C drugs. I'm assuming you all saw those alerts. If you didn't, uh, you should be reading about those and be knowledgeable about those. And in the hepatitis B world, we've got incredibly safe medicines, right? We have Entecavir, TDF, and TAF, those are the three leading drugs. LDT, lenivudine is basically gone. In my opinion, nobody should be using Adafibir or lenivudine now because these drugs are so much better, uh, safer. But it requires these patients to be on these drugs forever. So a lot of times when someone hears forever, which is really indefinite, people are not willing to start the medicine. Then they're on the medicine and then they stop taking the medicine because they, they're bored, they feel well, they don't think hepatitis B is serious. On the flip side, they think there's a hepatitis B stigma. They don't want to be labeled with hepatitis B, so they don't want to take a medicine for hepatitis B. And then there's a the concern about side effects, even with these very safe drugs, because TDF has been on the market now for HIV since 2002, was shown to cause renal injury over time. Probably 20, 25% of patients who take TDF for more than five years have detectable renal changes. Also, there's bone changes uh, and lipid changes actually that take place with TDF. TAF, we think, is much safer, but then the costs are higher, and again, get back into the issue about taking medicines indefinitely. So now we've got a big picture of over 40 new hepatitis B drugs in development. And I'm not going to show you a lot of data, just had 20 minutes to talk about this, so I'm going to talk more about the virology and molecular targets, and then give you hints about what's going on in drug development, give you some names, give you some companies. So this is a grid that talks about the different drugs, and I'm going to walk over a little closer and just use a little louder voice. So we've got... <clears throat> Gene silencers, this is interfering RNA, entry inhibitors in light blue, 
uh, little purple color capsid inhibitors. You know, we have what are called S antigen inhibitors. Thank you. Oh, good. Wondering why. That a little bit better? Fantastic. Thank you. You have another anti sense molecules. There's a company that used to be called ISIS that changed their name to IONIS uh, that has an anti sense, and they have a partnership, um, I think, with GSK. And then there's a lot going on with immune uh, mechanisms surrounding hepatitis B, virology, uh, protection, and clearance, and even a resurgence of different types of antibody preparations for hepatitis B. Stephen Lacronini, who's retiring in Australia, in Melbourne, it was called Hidero, which is a WHO affiliate, also an academic affiliate, is actually setting up a company that's looking at new types of antibodies, neutralizing antibodies for hepatitis B that might bring that back to the forefront. So you can see we've got phase one and phase two. There's nothing in phase three right now, but lots of activity in phase two. Interesting change that just took place, Assembly Biosciences, it's a Bay Area, San Francisco-based company. Uh, John McCutcheson, who is the Chief Scientific Officer at Gilead, quit Gilead about six weeks ago. Two weeks later, he's now the CEO of Assembly. So it's still a scientific political change that takes place. He's a, a genius that's out there. Um, Alilum has basically out-licensed their interfering RNA to a company called Vir, V-I-R. It's a privately held company. I really don't know much about what's going on within that company. I mentioned Ionis is a partner with GSK. Springbank is a Boston-based company that Nidafdal used to be the chief scientific officer for. Did Aftal move back to Harvard and is now just an advisor for Springbank, but Springbank is moving forward with their products. Gilead has a whole library of drugs that are there. I don't know much about this Golden Biotech company. I'm just going to leave that there, or the Green Cross. You already heard about Merclidex for all of you that were available, which is now called Uleviratide. Did I say that right? No, oh, is that a new name? And um, then Janssen is very, very big into this space. They acquired the um, intellectual property behind the Arrowhead interfering RNA product that's there. Well, Janssen's got very involved too. They have a TLR7, they've got a capsid inhibitor, they have some other products. Uh, Roche also has a TLR7 product that's here. Heck Pharma is a Chinese company. Uh, they've got an interesting uh, development also going on in the capsid uh, world uh, as well, which shows some very, very interesting information. So we have lots going on. There's a lot of controversy in the TLR7 space, because Roche has a TLR7, but Gilead had a TLR7 that failed. Uh, looked really good in um, chimps, uh, and um, I think it was synologous monkeys, and then uh, humans, no benefit. Uh, Gilead had another drug from Globamune, which is a ptarmigen-based, really a therapeutic vaccine. Also looked good in animal models, failed miserably in humans. So, the graveyard of hepatitis B drugs is actually relatively large because uh, this virus is very, very clever. It does all sorts of uh, interesting things. So the next issue is, is drug development. So we've got things with combination. We've got treatment in treatment, um, uh, uh, ongoing treated patients. We've got treatment naive patients. So there's a lot of guidelines that are out now on how to manage these patients in terms of clinical trials and what the primary endpoint should be. So one of the key things is this quantitative S antigen. That is a test that's available in most parts of the world, been available through Abbott, been available through Roche. And uh, interestingly, in the United States, we did not have this quantitative S antigen available until two years ago, because I and the group at Hepatitis B Foundation had been pushing on uh, Roche and Abbott to get an FDA cleared they never could get it through the FDA. They didn't invest the money. The FDA was unclear about the endpoints, and the US uh, AASLD team, the guidance team that writes the guidelines, was unconvinced that the S antigen quantitative test was useful. So Brian McMahon and I were on a conference call two days ago, and Brian still said, I don't see any role for quantitative S antigen, and the guidance committee didn't feel there was a role, so it's not in the guidelines. I pointed out to Brian that it's available in about 130 countries. Most people are using it outside the U.S. clinically in their practice. I don't know about India, but you get quant S shit on all your patients. So Nora Turo, the lead author on the hepatitis B guidelines, orders quant S on every patient. 
but she didn't put it in the guidelines. So I think there's a couple of negative people on the guideline committee, and they said they don't want it in there. It doesn't go in. So it's kind of like you have to have a unanimous um, group of people. But the bottom line is, Quant S is the standard for measuring a patient's current status and then measuring an ongoing status in a patient. And that status could be, what's their disease state? What phase of disease are they in? Uh, what's their response to their normal immune system? What's the response to a nucleoside or nucleotide analog? What's the response to interferon? Should you continue interferon or stop? It relates to infectivity alongside quantitative uh, HBV DNA. It relates in diff at its different levels to the risk of people getting uh, liver cancer. And uh, it's a long story. A Sanogen, in my opinion, is a very, very useful test. I order it in every patient because Quest in the United States released a Quant S assay that was standardized against the WHO panel and it's available throughout the US wherever you have access to the Quest laboratory system, which is most clinicians. So it's interesting how the community is far ahead of the guidelines because of, I think, a couple of, um, I don't know, people who are recalcitrant who aren't interested in changing the guidelines. So it's, a, it's an argument. But these guidelines are talking about S clearance or change in quant S or hitting certain percentages of S decrease at different time points. And then it talks about the number of patients, time to enroll those individuals. So phase two clinical trials is going to be about 200 patients. It's going to require 12 or 15 months of clinical work to get there. Everybody's looking at quant S as that on-treatment endpoint, and S clearance as the ultimate endpoint. A little bit more information from the FDA, and there's been input from the EMA on this as well and talking about how do you guide these. And there are certain preclinical requirements, including because of the risk of HCC, you need to have carcinogenicity studies and animal models uh, for at least six months. And you have to look at toxicity issues, especially if there's um, a specific model where it may be interfering in different parts of cell metabolism, like we talked about with the FIAU. Adult population first, pediatric later. Non-cirrhotic first, compensated cirrhosis second, decompensated cirrhosis third. Down here we're getting into even more interesting endpoints or monitoring, which is quantitating E antigen. We can't get that in the US, but do you have quant E shiv here? Yeah. So we should have it in the US, but again, it's back to regulatory issues. The US FDA has this what's called class one, class two, class three. So class one, you just need what's called PMA, pre-market approval. Basically fill out some forms, you're done. Class two is a 510K. I think I have this right. Is that correct, Jeff, in terms of the lab? So 510K, a little bit harder. And then you have this 510K and issues that class three is, which is what S antigen is. And that really makes the standard very high. We're uh, getting an FDA approval for class three like quantitative S antigen could cost between 10 and $40 million for a diagnostic test. Mm -hmm. And Abbott and Roche never saw a return on investment in the US to get it approved in the US. So they said, okay, Quest is gonna take this over. Quest is gonna make uh, the test assay available. HPV RNA quantification. This virus is making RNA. The RNA's uh, in actually in the form of these viral um, capsids uh, and encoded also in surface antigen. And that RNA is directly related to what's happening with CCC DNA. And of course, CCC DNA is very important. You can't quantitate CCC DNA because you need a liver biopsy. The RNA gives you the CCC DNA transcriptional activity. That correlated antigen, which is three different antigens in one assay, it's a Japanese company that has that, also relates very closely to what's happening with the CCC DNA activity and transcriptional activity. In this case, instead of measuring RNA, we're measuring three different proteins. There's different types of S antigen, there may be fragments, there may be mutants that are there, those are also being measured. Then we talk about this immune complex issue with different types of neutralizing antibodies that ultimately may be involved with what we call immune control of hepatitis B. So very, very complicated virus, uh, complicated modeling of how to get to uh, drug approval. Uh, this is the guidance that suggests approval based on the different surrogate markers and a safety database to get through a phase three study is going to require 
a large number of patients, number of studies, and at least two years to that primary endpoint. The primary endpoint, again, is S loss. And what the FDA wants to see is a stable S loss. So if you have X number of patients that get the S loss, six to 12 month follow up, the goal is to have 80, 90% of those patients maintain S loss. So very complicated issue with those. And this just goes into a little bit more detail about monitoring uh, those patients and these different viral uh, assays. All right, now we're going to talk about diagrams. We're going to talk about the virus. This is very, very interesting to me because this, to me, this virus is one of the more complicated viruses, although maybe it's because we've studied it so much. You already heard a little bit this morning about blocking entry into the uh, liver cell. Uh, the NTCP is the receptor, the primary receptor for uptake of hepatitis B into the liver. And that can be blocked with Merclidex, which is this uh, synthetic um, uh, protein that looks similar to surface antigen. Oh, you did? Great. Thank you. High tech. I love it. Thank you very much. All right. Next targets that we're going to talk about here would be targeting the X antigen, which is a um, transactivating protein that's involved and required for viral replication. It's also, interestingly, either causing or influential in risk for liver cancer for hepatitis B. There are a few drugs that are targeting this, but they're in preclinical right now. Interfering RNA, where you are producing um, RNA sequences that are complementary and bind to what's called a risk complex and then cleave RNA messenger or pregenomic RNA that's coming off uh, the CCC DNA. Look at all the different uh, compounds that are in this space. So we've got um, the Arbutus compounds, which are two different interfering RNA, one IV, one sub Q. We have ARC520 and now Aero HDV. These are these compounds that Arrow had moved through uh, their development process that Janssen required. Uh, the really interesting discovery was is that with the first set of these compounds, ARC520, is that they had a release system that used a B venom type protein and led to lysosomal escape or lysosomal lysis. In a uh, primate model, as they were developing the drug, they were well into human studies, heading into phase 2B studies. Uh, the cinemologous monkeys that they were using for toxicity ended up dying. I mean, not just a liver failure, but a multi-system inflammatory response. So, fortunately, they had already started their second level of drug development and have a different delivery system for the Aero HDV, and it's sub-Q, not IV, and that's what Janssen acquired, and Janssen just gave Arrowhead another $25 million last week for hitting a milestone, and that Arrowhead HDV is going into phase 2B with a Janssen capsid inhibitor, so starting now, it's actually Roland's going to start a combination therapy is moving forward quickly. And that's a logical process, which is to inhibit capsid formation, viral release. Viral release is going to be inhibiting viral particles with RNA, inhibiting viral particles with DNA. And we really do think it's going to take two, three, or even what I think is going to be four drugs to get to an S loss rate that needs to be at 40% at one year or less. That's what I tell companies that I advise, that's what I tell investors I advise, although Nid Aftal about two weeks ago said, guess you need to quit saying this 40% at one year, it's impossible, we're never going to get there. I said, Nid, you got to set the goal high. Spring Bank, which has a good drug, it's an immunomodulator, which we'll talk about, is moving you know, their drug forward, but also is going to be used in combination probably with two or three different drugs. Recently, there's been a lot of information on what are called RNA destabilizers, and the exact mechanism of how these work is not clear to me, but Arbutus and um, uh, I think this is Roche that's here also has got these RNA destabilizers that are in, in development right now that would also inhibit full virus uh, formation and release. There's capsid inhibitors, there's type 1 and type 2. Type 1, I think, is deformed, type 2 are empty capsids, but if you can't form a capsid, you can't release hepatitis B RNA, you can't release hepatitis B DNA, you can't have infectious viruses released from the cells. So that's uh, very, very, I think, uh, going to be a core or backbone of managing hepatitis B. Polymerase inhibitors or reverse transcriptase inhibitors, we have Intecavir, TDF, and TAF. 
Uh, those are already standard available globally. Right now, TDF in Africa costs $50 a year. This is down to the point where broad-based treatment is available for most people, most patients in most countries, uh, and is affordable, and eventually will be proving cost effectiveness and I think even uh, cost savings. Underneath here is what's called an RNA ACE H inhibitor. Not a lot is known about that, but that RNA ACE sits on the inside of the capsid as the capsid completes its shape. The virus puts an RNA into the viral capsid, and then the RNA has to be broken down as the DNA is formed and released as an infectious virus. That also inhibits the release of full viral particles. We heard a little bit more this morning about these NAPs, these polymers that block surface antigen release. There's been data coming out on those since 2013 when the first studies were done in Bangladesh. Then they moved to, moved to Moldova, and now they're doing studies with the ACDG, which is the HIV hep B co-infection group, and they're doing other studies in the world. This drug is interesting in the sense is that people are very worried about toxicity, direct toxicity from these uh, polymers, or indirect toxicity that might lead to hepatitis B accumulation inside the liver cell, which may also be carcinogenic. Let's see, we talked about entry inhibitors or Merclodex already. There's a lot going on in the innate immunity and adaptive immunity system. Um, in the innate, we already talked about TLR7 and TLR8. The idea about TLR8, it really affects at least five major different cellular uh, mechanisms of uh, antiviral or antiviral immunology. And then the Rigai agonist spring bank that we talked about, which stimulates this uh, retinoid-induced uh, gene, um, and oh, it's also sting, is another part of that pathway. Adaptive immunity has been very interesting because there was a study that Gilead did in partnership with BMS and Ed Gain in New Zealand, where a PD-1 monoclonal antibody, nivolumab, was administered in combination with a new, specifically TBF. And on top of that, there was a subgroup of patients who had another immune modulator, which I think was their TLR7. They did have one patient who cleared S antigen, another couple of patients where S antigen levels dropped. They were using one tenth of the dose of nivolumab that we use for our HCC patients. And uh, it was unclear whether that was too low of a dose, um, but really what the concern was was toxicity. TDF, TAF, and Tecavir are very safe compounds. PD-1, PDL1, CTLA-4, these other drugs that are used for liver cancer and a variety of other somatic cancers have a three, five, seven percent risk of very severe or potentially life-threatening autoimmune reactions, including pneumonitis, renal disease, um, skin uh, problems, a variety of other uh, autoimmune processes that can take place. CAR T or T cell engineering, some very interesting modeling that Antonio Bertoletti has been doing in Singapore, uh, really administering that to B patients with liver cancer, but has shown some interesting early antiviral effects of these targeted uh, T cells. There's a number of vaccines. We talked about the Gilead uh, product that they have, the global immune, that did not work, that has closed out. And then Transgene is a French company that has an adenovirus based. Uh, vaccine and that also look great in animal models look great in vitro and some rodent models and they went into humans and no effect on this <coughs> antigen so i'm not sure exactly where they're going to where they're going to go with that one of the things i want to make clear is this whole issue about hepatitis b being incurable so right now we only use the word cure when we say functional cure functional cure is a bit of an oxymoron but it, functional cure means loss of s antigen with or without surface antibody but that doesn't mean the patient's cured of anything. They still have CCC DNA. And what we have is a great test for CCC DNA, which is called core antibody. The core antibody that's released or uh, made by Abbott and by Roche has a false positive rate of two per thousand. So if you've got a patient with core antibody in your practice, that person has CCC DNA in their liver, and the core antibody titer actually correlates with CCC DNA activity. It's a very cheap test. So on my wish list, if I could get everything I wanted on my lab, I wouldn't get just core antibody, but I would get the titers of core antibody. But that would be giving me information in combination with DNA quant 
Hepatitis B surface antigen quantification and E antigen quantification, all of which helps you decide what's happening with that patient. I should I don't have a clock around here. How much more time do I have? Am I doing okay? I know you need to go. No, but that's okay. That's right? How many, uh, to, ten more minutes? Yeah. Okay. All right, great. All right, so I'm going to dig into this just a little bit more, if I can get that. Okay, so CCC DNA targeting. We're going to dig a little bit deeper in here. So how does the body take care of DNA? We have a variety of different endonucleases, which may be used for host homeostasis or potentially to attack viruses or other uh, molecules that are there, including cancer cells. So CRISPR has been the hottest tar uh, target here, where you can actually go in and cleave DNA at a specific target. And once that DNA is cleaved, it then becomes a victim of other endonucleases that are in the cell. CRISPR also has the ability to extract DNA and then reinsert DNA, which has been very important because we understand that with hepatitis B, we have integrated hepatitis B into the hepatocyte genome probably within one or two months of acute infection. It's probably seen in everybody with chronic infection, and it's that integrant that's doing two things. It's making S antigen, so you think you've got a cure, the CCC DNA is gone, but S antigen may still be coming off integrated uh, viruses. Number two is that this issue um, about uh, the uh, CRISPR is that you could be cleaving and extracting the integrated CCC DNA. At the same time, you might be cleaving this, uh, the, sorry, it, extracting the integrated DNA, which is short segments, only making S antigen, the same time you're targeting uh, CCC DNA. What about CCC DNA destabilizers? This goes back to the fact that if you are changing the methylation pattern, the interaction with ribosomes, um, you may actually then open up CCC DNA to standard endonucleases and allow that to be cleared as also. These are two epigenetic regulators that I've just learned about in the last few weeks. I can't tell you a lot about those, but the CCC DNA in the liver cell is in at least 22 different forms. And this is open, partially open, closed, and then there's a number of different modifiers, including different methylation patterns that take place. So these epigenetic regulators may change that and allow standard or cellular protection mechanisms such as endonucleases to operate. What's going to inhibit CCC DNA formation? Well, one of the classic messages here is the CPAMs. The CCC DNA is being depleted and then re-synthesized um, uh, and regenerated back in the nucleus. <coughs> if you stop capsid formation, capsids aren't taking uh, DNA back into the nucleus and the CCC DNA is not being replenished. So over time, depending on the CCC DNA half-life, you may have a natural clearance of CCC DNA by inhibiting the replenishment in the nucleus by having a defective uh, capsid uh, um, and eventually core formation. All right, just a few more minutes. This is uh, X antigen, which we talked about before. This uh, different ways of targeting X are often indirect, but there are some products that are being developed that may actually target X directly and that may decrease uh, replication competence of the virus, may decrease the um, ability of this virus to be causing cancer as well. Uh, just a little bit more on RNA interference. I think we covered that in detail. Let's see what else we have here. We're going through a lot. We talked about capsid. So each of these slides have really gone through in detail where these targets uh, may be working. All right, immunotherapeutic drugs, we talked about TLR7, TLR8, this Rigai nod agonist from Springbank, which is an oral medication. It stimulates pathways that are very similar to the pathways you see with standard interferon or pegylated interferon therapy, much less side effects. And there are signals that it's having an effect on S antigen production and correlated antigen production, as well as HPV DNA. Although the effect is a half a log to one log, it's not really profound but it is turning on the immune system. A number of companies are in the therapeutic vaccine space. The one I talked about before is this TG1050. It's got an adenovirus base, which has its uh, own uh, problems with it. But it's, uh, the formulation includes core antigen, polymerase, and surface antigen that you're vaccinating against. 
There's a couple of other vaccines here that are of an electroporation adjuvant or DNA-based vaccines. This one includes S antigen, core antigen, and IL-12. We talked about checkpoint inhibition. Um, there's also another immune modulator that's um, a uh, CD47 that's being developed in the Bay Area that may also uh, bring about an immune response and change checkpoint inhibition in dendritic cells uh, specifically. A few other agents, let me make sure we've gone through all these. Uh, we've got these core protein allosteric modulators, capsid assembly modulators. These are really talking about drugs that are similar to these. What I want to see in those capsid or core protein modulators is an immediate reduction in correlated antigen. Uh, some of the companies aren't really showing that data yet. It's one of the critiques I had about the assembly uh, uh, presentation of easel last year. You know, if you're inhibiting capsid in core formation, you should be able to show correlated antigen decline early. They never showed the data at the meetings. I was a little bit interested to uh, say, why, why is there an absence of data here? But uh, the heat is on for all the companies to show that early. We talked about the Rigai agonist, Eric Benarigavir. Uh, this is the patient population we already talked about. This 989 is the Arrowhead, Arrow HPV. It's got the, the same name. And we talked about levetiracetam that's here and therapeutic vaccine. This T101, I think, is also made by on transgene. This just shows you what RNA interference can do. This is mean log and S antigen from day one. Nader S antigen reduction. Here we're looking at about 1.2 to over three logs. These products of Arrowhead and using what's called a trim delivery system has both X and S triggers. That means that this is short segment RNAs. I think they're 21 mers in length. We're targeting those two areas, but it, actually this is a very compact virus. So you hit one spot, you're often hitting the production of two or three of the different viral proteins. Safety profile looks really, really good. They're not using this melatonin, this B venom for lysosomal release. We're seeing changes in HPV DNA, HPV RNA, E antigen and correlated antigen. I was really happy to be working with Arrowhead since 2011 because they're a very transparent company. They do all the right assays, they're doing everything up front, showing that. And this is the group that we uh, got data together in the CHIMP model that proved how much S antigen is coming off integrated virus. Uh, that integrated virus sequences are truncated. Uh, HBD RNA and they can measure different lengths of HBD RNA and tell what's coming off integrants versus what's coming off of uh, CCC DNA. All right, so this is some more information um, on the REP compound and just talking about responders. You saw this morning about Delta, but this is S antigen reduction and can commonly arise in anti HBS. I thought this was a little bit of BS when I first saw it, but now I realize that that S antibody production is, in my mind, signaling better levels of immune control. You got higher levels of surface antibody, especially if it's a polyclonal response, your chance of having a maintained S suppression uh, is better. This little bit of information on CRISPR and CAS targeting. I could go into this in great detail. I think this has wonderful promise. But the problem is about delivery and having off-target effects. So you can review this uh, data that was uh, shown in 2018 um, and looking at strong antiviral effects in a hep G2 model. Let's see, I think we talked about most of these. So we have a lot of time left. We're on CCC DNA. We have problems with assay. We have problems with accessing liver tissue animal models, there's a circular model that's out that's close to human CCC DNA but doesn't have the exact life cycle. Uh, this is more on interrigavir, HPV DNA reduction, HPV RNA reduction, in both E antigen negative and E antigen positive. It was interesting here that they had a bigger effect in E negative patients. TLR8 induces innate and adaptive response. Information on TLR7 is also in here. I'm putting a lot of my money and effort into uh, supporting capsid assembly and siRNA. I think those are the two best targets now. Unfortunately, that's now entering phase 2B studies under Janssen's uh, direction. Let's see if there's anything else up here that we didn't cover. Just lots and lots of information, summary information on these different trials. So that's a fast uh, peek at what's going on in the hepatitis uh, 
the drug development world, and we can open it to questions. Uh, people have a few more minutes. You're okay. Thank you. Should we get a combination picture? Yes, again before you go. specific host proteins, um, but uh, it's very early stage people looking for direct inhibitors of X function. Okay. Very early. Please. Yeah. So you said that you are using quanta HBS antigen for, uh, in your practice for almost all patients. Exactly. Now, where do you exactly, what kind of information are you really you're interpreting from there? Okay. So the, yes, the question is, what do I do with a quant S that I see in a patient in the clinic? So I get a quant S when they come in, their first diagnosed. So that quant S can range from five to 10 or 20,000. So there's a huge range. If their numbers are in the 10 to 20,000 range and the ALT is 20 or 25, that person is never gonna clear S antigen on their own. 
that's a person who I'm going to think about intervention with a new. I don't use interferon right now. I'm also going to think about putting them in clinical trials. <coughs> Conversely, if someone comes in and their S antigen is 75 and their ALT is 150, I'm not going to put them on a new. That person's got a very high probability that they're going to be clearing S in the short term. This is, of course, going to be influenced by their E antigen status. Uh, I might also get core and pre core mutations on that patient. If they're core or pre-core mutation positive, a low S doesn't give me as much information as a low S would be in an E positive patient who's core and pre-core negative. Higher the S antigen, higher risk of liver cancer. So I've got an S positive patient whose S is at 5,000. He has two uncles with liver cancer. These are secondary relatives, not first degree relatives. Um, in, the, in that setting, I'm gonna be still thinking about a higher risk of liver cancer and starting surveillance. If the mom is pregnant and her HPV DNA level is 100,000, but her S antigen is 9,000, which is very high, she would be one person who would be a high risk of failing using just HBIG and vaccine at birth. I would very likely put her on a nuke for the last trimester to try and bring her HPV DNA lower. Because S antigen plus DNA levels correlate with the chance of the baby failing vaccine and HBIG therapy. If you're in a setting where you don't have HBIG, because HBIG is too expensive, but TDF is cheap, even more likely I'd be using TDF during the third trimester. Uh, those are just some examples. If I'm confused about the patient's uh, status, are they uh, chronic infection or chronic hepatitis, I'm going to be using the S antigen in combination with ALT and fiber scan to determine what phase they're in of their disease. Does it help you in also deciding the end of therapy? So yes, so someone's on TDF for three years and their S antigen has come down to 90, but it's then 80, then 82. That's a person I'm very likely to stop their TDF and see if they flare and clear. They're on TDF, their viral levels, their S antigen levels staying at 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. There's no reason to stop their nuke therapy. There's no way they're going to clear when you stop the nuke. Though if you use interferon, of course, we have stopping rules. You don't have a half log reduction at 12 weeks. The chance of uh, clearing S antigen is almost zero with interferon. You would just stop your interferon therapy. So S antigen's got lots of uses. Why it's not in the guidelines, I am still in shock. Because in the guidelines that they wrote, they said you should be vaccinating patients who are core antibody positive. There's no data in the entire world that there's a clinical benefit of vaccinating core positive patients. You can get a surface antibody cosmetic response, but that doesn't mean you're doing anything for the patient. In fact, you could be doing harm because then you're telling the patient you're vaccinated, you're protected. They're not protected from reactivation, right? So the guidelines are kind of weird. One area they ignore 200 papers. Another place they're saying to do something that has nothing published. So I'm giving- Can, can uh, quant S antigen replace an HBV DNA? Do they correlate that way? So S antigen and HBV DNA correlate well in E positive patients. They correlate poorly in E negative patients. The reason in E negative patients there's a poor correlation is a lot of the S antigens coming off integrins. So I wouldn't say replace. That's really a weird thing. The FDA goes, you have one test that has to stand alone and be proven to go to the moon and back. You know, it's just ridiculously high uh, standards. Anything in hepatitis B is all about a matrix. You're integrating DNA, ALT, family history, cancer biomarkers, their fibrosis on fibro scan, E antigen quant if you have it, S antigen quant if you have it. So when I have a hep B patient, I'm always looking at 11 different factors to decide where they are, what to do, and what to tell the patient. The FDA doesn't get that. One test, you have a big answer for one test. We're gone, we're past that now. Great questions. Yes? Mm -hmm. On the basis of HBS antigen level or level, we can decide if how many cells infected by the uh, HBV in the liver. So the question is how many cells are infected? Uh, there's a crude correlation about number of cells infected between these different products that we have. 
but there's no direct linear correlation. And infectious means how many copies of CCC DNA, um, how many viruses in each cell, if there are viruses, if there are cells that are virus free, which we think there are, um, not every hepatocyte is, has hepatitis B CCC DNA in it, maybe 50% or 40%. But that really comes down to the next phase, which is doing liver biopsies on hepatitis B patients, which nobody wants to hear that. But we now have fine needle aspirates, right? FNA, what's the risk of bleeding from an FNA? One in 5,000 or something. And we're getting 50 to 100,000 cells when you do an FNA. And our tests are getting refined enough that when you get that many cells, you can actually look at HPV DNA, CCC DNA, RNA, and expression of different viral antigens. Not perfect yet, but it's in development. I think we'll be doing more FNAs in the future, trying to define cure, clearance, you know, what's going on in the immune system in the liver as well. So tests for CCC DNA, there is no standard right now. Each company is coming up with their own assay. I know that Gilead last year spent nine months coming up with their own internal assay. Jeff, do you have any comments about CCC DNA assays? It's, um, we'll just call it rough science right now. Not, not, nowhere near perfected. And nobody, and all these lists we talked about are companies, the diagnostics, are trying to come up with a commercial CCC DNA assay. Abbott's the closest. Abbott's really doing a very active job in both B and Delta to come up with assays that can help companies and help with drug development. And Gavin Clorty is the person leading <coughs> that effort. He is one of the best you know, scientists I've ever worked with. Yes? Uh, there is a recent paper uh, in Blox Pathology uh, they showed that uh, when they blocked the apolipoprotein E and they found that there is a 90% reduction in the patho in the infectivity of the HBV. So uh, how do, what do you think that if we huh. use this uh, in combination with the DNA replication targeting then can we found something that is to cure the chronic infection because they were they have created an uh, animal model that is having this chronic infection of HBV and then finally they, they claim that they have the 90% reduction. Well, there's a long story about interaction of lipids and cholesterol with different viruses, including hepatitis C. C yes. Somebody in Oklahoma named Teddy Bader was claiming that by giving statins to hepatitis C patients with a little bit of interferon, they had a much higher cure rate. You remember that, Jeff? It was kind of a, a fad. You, you want to comment on the APO, uh, lipoprotein B? I don't know much about that. I mean, you can't say 90% reduction is, is a lot. You can't even. And for clearing out the liver, you have probably have to go multiple lots. So it may have some measurable effect, but I don't, you're still, it's like being a little bit pregnant. You're either pregnant or not pregnant. So you're still going to be infected. So I don't think it's, it's the panacea. I think what's going to happen in the liver world is every liver patient is going to be on a staff, no matter what disease they have. Because we have some benefit from statins on cancer, hormonal hypertension, fibrosis, inflammation, um, maybe a modest antiviral effect. So it's interesting, but one log, that's not going to get you anybody to invest 50 million in your drug. You've got to go down two, three logs at least. But statins are great. Everybody should be on them. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah. Can I take that? That's it. And I would like to thank Professor Gish and Professor Blair for taking time out of their busy schedules and visiting the MBS. And hope that you have a great time in India. You enjoy your visit and have a good food. Hope to see you again. Great questions.